over the years as this series has been going, I've been um, paying attention to it. And I just want to say um, just, just how pleased I am that it's six, such a successful series and, uh, and was so glad to know that people were had started it because um, I had only thought about it. <laughs> but the people who actually started it, I think, really deserve um, some praise. Um, I'm going to, I guess, go, I'm going to read you a couple of, from a couple of different things tonight. Um, some new poetry that I'm writing about Edmonton, uh, Edmonton's Indigenous history, plus a little bit from my collection called The Pemmican Eaters. But first, I just want to talk about this whole idea about history and who defines history and what it is. Um, because for me, history, I conceive of it as the continuous present. I don't see it as past, present, future. And <clears throat> if you'll bear with me a, f a few minutes, I, I'm going to do something very academic and read you a couple of quotes. But um, most of my presentation won't be that. So, I find it interesting that uh, Vine Delorier Jr. Uh, in his book, The Met Metaphysics of Modern Existence, writes about uh, the Euro-Western thinkers. And he says, Tillich, who was a, a historian, and Western thinkers generally find the center of history in the life of Jesus. And the most agnos agnostic Western thinker still classifies time according to BC slash AD scheme. Only recently, in scientific circles, have people begun to use the, the word BP, before, before the present, as a means of establishing dates in world history. We can look for alternative interpretations of the center of history once we transcend the Western religious tradition, and the center can be said to occur almost any time within the respective human cultural traditions as each might perceive it. The possibilities are endless. We do not yet understand the origins of our species, the derivation of culture and technology, or the relationship of our planet to the rest of the universe. So it is, it is at least premature to categorize the history as having a center with its geographical roots in the activities and events of a, a specific region and people. My sense of time, as I said, is I call it the continuous present. And I call it that because I don't believe my ancestors are gone, that they are still very much alive, not in, a physical, not in this physical world, but, but very much alive. And their energy and passion is what motivates me to write, to break the silence of our history on this land. Another quote that I like by uh, Vine Delorier in a book uh, which is called God is Red, he writes, the Western European peoples have never learned to consider the nature of the world discerned from a spatial point of view. And a singular difficulty faces peoples of Western European heritage in making a transition from thinking in terms of time to thinking in terms of space. The very essence of Western European identity involves the assumption that time proceeds in a linear fashion. Further, it assumes that at a particular point in the unraveling of this sequence, the peoples of Western Europe became the guardians of the world. Which, as we know, if we think about it in broader terms, is absolutely ridiculous. How could one place in the world define our entire history? So um, for me, indigenous history has been devalued. It's been ignored. It's been suppressed and is finally of interest to people in this country after the TRC. And I'm very, very glad of that. Um, but we have a long way to go to correct attitudes towards indigenous thought and history as constituted in this place called Alberta. Um, and I say that because um, there were many settlements in this province that were settled before this was a province. Um, 1844, Lac Saint Anne, 
was a settlement. 1847, Rundle Mission was established. 1862, Victoria Settlement uh, was established, which is just outside Smoky Lake. 1870, Rupert's Land was transferred from Canada, uh, from, to Canada from the HBC. 1876 was the treaty. 1892, um, Edmonton's uh, original name, Amaskwachiwaskaigan, uh, was then incorporated into a city and we're called Edmonton. And um, so in 1904, Edmonton is actually becomes a city. In 1905, Alberta becomes a province. So you can see that even if you look at the timeline, our sense of history is really kind of backwards because uh, the province came much later than Indigenous people actually being on this uh, territory. Um, and so this brings me to um, sort of the next part of my presentation where I'm going to read you some poems that I've written about uh, Edmonton. And one of the reasons I, I have been motivated to write about um, Edmonton is because when I first arrived here in, um, um, I grew up in small town Alberta, and when I arrived here in, I think it was about 1984, I couldn't locate myself. I didn't know where I was in terms of indigenous communities, about the history of Edmonton, and, I, and it took me a long time to figure that out. And I don't think that's, I don't think that's um, just um, happenstance. There's a reason why people don't know indigenous history in this country, because it's dangerous to know that history. It's dangerous because if you were on a piece of land, if you own a piece of land in this province, if you looked at the history of it, you may not be as proud of owning that piece of land once you delved into the history. Because there was a lot of very ugly, unfair, unjust things that happened in this province. One of them was uh, script fraud uh, from the Métis. So, which I will talk about in a minute. But first, let me read you um, a poem which I've called Brown Names. <clears throat> and um, I've started with just a little uh, epigram by Charles Wright, who's an American poet. Memory is a cemetery I have visited once or twice. White ubiquitous, and the set aside everywhere underfoot. Ubiquitous walks through me regularly, down streets named White, Grierson, or Jasper, reiterating my absence. I wonder why this bluff overlooking the North Saskatchewan was, as, was envisioned as brickworks, smokestacks, and glass mills. When a Musquachee was skygin floated in prairie grass, so high you used a compass to cross it after a three-month cart ride from Winnipeg. When Karakonte, Kalahu, Bapas Chase, Bobtail, Atakakup gathered on the river flats, long before Oliver, Grierson, or Strathcona, their names, barbed wire reminders, sewn to the imperial center, ignore any glimpse of Lapitak, the fort's hunter flinting chert for deer hunting arrows before this city constructed a myth of steel bridges, concrete stories of settlements and pioneers. Ubiquitous rarely owns the brown memory of a Métis great-grandmother, a Cree Iroquois, Mohawk, Nakoda, or Blackfoot Tapan, the Carlton Trail cart driving relatives, the third cousin twice removed in St. Albert, the HBC paymaster or the Orkney York boat building side of the family. Ubiquitous knows that exile is a space without language to speak of it, that alienation is a wall only you can see. Um, this next poem is, is from the point of view of um, 
Louise Umperville, who was married to Chief Factor Rowan, who uh, became one of the most powerful chief factors in um, the Hudson's Bay Company. And um, he, was, he had several nicknames. <clears throat> I think the Blackfoot called him Iron Shirt. He was also called Big Mountain because he weighed about 300 pounds. And he was also called One Pound One. And um, you'll find out in a, reason, in a moment why he's called One Pound One. He, um, he went out hunting by himself. Um, and there was only one person that saw what direction he left camp from, and that was Louise Umperville. Uh, Chief Actor Owen did not come back to camp, and people wondered, well, what happened to him? And the only person that went looking for him was Louise Umperville. And she found him, of course, on the prairie. He had been thrown by his horse uh, and broke his leg. And uh, she brought him back to camp and, uh, and uh, mended him, took care of him, and he married her. Um, when he married her, she had a, a dowry of horses. Um, and that's, it's interesting that when you read back in the history of uh, this place, you realize that one of the most bothersome or irritating things that went on was a lot of horse thieving uh, from groups uh, all over. So, um, so horses were really a valuable uh, commodity and uh, she had quite a dowry of horses before um, she married him. So this is from her point of view. I have crossed this river countless times, she thought, her unchained self slipping into updrafts and downturning dreams. Name it an itch or an urge. She reached out her mind in search of a young clerk. His horse returned without him. Who knows what this Métis woman camped on the tabled North Saskatchewan river flats envisioned when the rotund Rowan said Tantse to her fat dowry of horses. Alone, he went hunting that day, the horse reared, whipping its backbone into a figure eight before throwing his big mountain, 300 pounds, too much for any dumb limb onto the prairie, his legs snapping under the weight of his ambition to rise from good clerk to czar of the prairies, where she'd eventually take him, her conveyor belt of relatives delivering pelts, right to his front door. Why search for Big Mountain, this iron shirt? This foreign man who could outwork and swear any man she'd known. What picture of herself did she see in him that day she emerged from her tent to meet his eyes? The days when a fur trade monopoly made both their choices. What seduced her? Was it him? or his horse. Uh, another one about um, Rowan uh, built this, because he was czar of the prairies, of course, he had to build this big house. And he built this big house in very cold Edmonton. And people said, you fool, how are you going to heat that thing? This tremendous big house, and now he's going to have to heat it. So, so they named it uh, Rowan's Folly. And that's what this poem is called, Rowan's Folly. The root cellar of her heart gave way the day he went missing. She fevered and fretted over this rotund white stranger who might be a fine country match. She felt his eyes tracing the dotted line of her ghosted country, where her ancestors, Toivrois, traced maps. When she spotted him, small crumpled dot on the broken leg prairie, his reflection in her, in her eyes was bigger than he'd ever dreamt. He saw a river of beaver pelts stretching down the North Saskatchewan, brought by her relatives. The pelts, shiny and thick, bailed for loading into York boats. Saw men wearing sashes, smoking pipes, leaning their lives into the silt and shifting sand of the North Saskatchewan. He saw her steeping scraped hides in alder bark. He saw burnt wood people, camps and quarries, men flaking chert into arrowheads. 
and cutting tools. He saw women in moccasins, short leggings, wrap around quilts, picking Saskatoons for pounding into the dust of buffalo meat. He saw a fort, his own folly, settlers brought by the giant black horse. Um, Victoria Belcourt Callahoo um, was the great granddaughter of uh, Chief Factor Rowan and Louise Umperville. And um, you know, she still lived in a time where they would go on buffalo hunts. They would start out from Lac St. Anne and they'd pick up people in, in uh, St. Albert Edmonton, um, all the way down as far as uh, Tail Creek and the Stetler area to go out onto the, the plains and hunt bison. And um, at age 70, she won a jigging contest. And um, she did jig at age 100, but this I've taken liberty with this poem and she's 100 years old jigging. It's called Victoria's Jig. Victoria Callahoo enters a jigging contest on her 100th birthday, lining up with girls in stiff crinolines and women with child-rearing legs. She in high-topped moccasins, patched dress, and hide-skinning muscle take the dance floor. The, the attention of onlookers converging on her tiny gray frame alone at the center her toes at attention, waiting to spring, to the fiddler's bow, swept along, strumming guitar, stitching her feet to strings bending, the hem of her dress bouncing, onlookers gasping at her feet, exacting swift step changes, weightless and nimble, she skim shuffles in the fiddler's trance, her young face shining through her old smile, bouncing off the surprised faces of the child-rearing women, the deflated crinolines of girls leaning in disappointment as, Victor Vic as Victoria takes first place. And um, she also spoke on the, uh, one of the first telephones that was in Edmonton. And um, I love this story because um, only when she speaks Cree into it does she, real, does she say it works. Bewapskos <laughs> is uh, the wire. Um, can they, um, uh, let's see, what have I got in here? Kinehiawan Chi, do you speak or do you understand Cree? <clears throat> the wire. At 101, Victoria Belcourt Callahu tested the Cree on Bewapskos. Kinehiawanchi, her pronunciation echo circling, small winging her words, sil syllables whistling, a Musquachiwa Skygan, Wataskawan, Masquachi, through the thin black lines back to Victoria's ear, and a plump smile confirming that the white man's black stick, the long black line, Bewapskos, works. Um, a couple of years ago, um, CBC had a contest on the radio, morning radio, to you could phone in and say what Edmonton's signature dish was. And uh, all these people were phoning in, and finally it came to uh, green onion cakes. That was the Edmonton's signature dish. And as much as I love green onion cakes, you can tell how far away Edmontonians are from their history because this next poem, uh, the last line, is actually what Edmonton's signature dish was. Amasquachiwa Skygin, Edmonton, former borough of London, England. I know your British sensibility, your cultured appetite, refined palate for the freshest local buffalo roast, sweet new potatoes, rhubarb crisp, and endless tea from copper pots. Striped point blankets for hooded capotes, beaver pelts, buffalo robes, and the center positioning of self. Traders, freighters, builders of York boats chasing a river through a sea of grass and bison to men in outposts, filling diaries of wind and weather. Like Fort Edmonton, pemmican supplier, York boat builder, 
coal supplier whose memory is faded about itself as Beaver Hills House, Fort Augustus, Fort de Prairie, and its appetite wane for its signature dish, pickled buffalo tongues. Yeah, so, you know, like, so I think Edmonton has really forgotten uh, its history about uh, this place, um, that it was a pemmican supplier. And, uh, and I think that's one of the very, I don't even know if that's even talked about here. I I've, I've actually haven't seen it. Maybe it's at Fort Edmonton now, I don't know. Um, I'm going to read you some poems from um, the pemmican eaters now. Um, <clears throat> just let me find my list. Um, I decided to call this the Pemmican Eaters because of um, Sir John A. Macdonald uh, referred to the Métis as the miserable half-breeds, the Pemmican Eaters. Excuse me. And, um, you know, it just, it's sort of like in a slap in the face because without Pemmican, there would have been no fur trade. There was no imperishable food that was available. Um, it just wouldn't have happened. Um, so, um, and I just want to read you the opening. I found a great quote for this uh, collection of poetry. <clears throat> I couldn't believe it when I found it. It was that kind of thing. Um, and and I've, I actually have not even read the book that it comes from, but I just love the quote so much. What the map cuts up, the story cuts across. Um, by Michelle de Surtou, The Practice of Everyday Life. Um, my family is related to Gabriel Dumont through um, the famous Gabriel Dumont's uncle. Um, if, everyone, if anyone ever tells you they're related directly, a d direct descendant of Gabriel Dumont, they're lying because he never had any children. They, he and his wife never had children. So there are no direct descendants. And my family comes from his uh, his uncle's line, whom he's named after. And his uncle lived in the Edmonton area and was captain of the hunt at Lac St. Um, and it seemed to be similar kind of character actually to, to Gabriel Dumont. Um, so let me just read you some po poems from this collection. Otpemsawak, the free people, is what the Métis sometimes we call ourselves. Otpemsuak, <clears throat> baby pound maker or even big bear, would have dreamt those waking figures, gatling gun sorrows, bullets, crosses, and misguided soldiers if they were Riel or Dumont. While McDonald's swilling spirits was in some crystal case of glory, and Louis dreamt that supposedly in broad daylight, the dawn on its unseen bone was lifting above the fire. I don't believe he was merely mistaken, regardless of how little daylight remained. This evening, I retrieved a piece of birch bark, and something more like a petrified limb lay in the palm of a snowdrift. I thought of Louis, the way he kept envisioning what was inside the dimness, how he dreamt of it ascending on its unseen limb, how he wanted it to reflect like water. Um, this next poem is a, quite an old one, but it found its way into this book thematic because it just fit thematically. It's a letter to Sir John A. Macdonald, um, who, as you know, uh, basically cleared the plains of indigenous people. Sorry about Cody, I'm <laughs> messing with the lav mic. Um, as you know, he cleared the plains of indigenous people so that uh, we could have this railway. Dear John, I'm still here and half-breed. After all these years, you're dead. Funny thing, that railway you wanted so badly. There was talk a year ago of shutting it down. And part of it was shut down, the dayliner at least from sea to shining sea. And you know, John, after all that shuffling us around to suit the settlers, we're still here. We're still here after Meech Lake and one no-good-for-nothing Indian holding up the train 
stall in the cabin syllables, nouns of settlement, steel syntax, and the long sentence of its exploitation. And John, that goddamned railroad never made this a great nation because the railway shut down and this country is still quarreling over unity. And Riel is dead, but he just keeps coming back in all the Bill Wilsons yet to speak out of turn or favor, because you know, as well as I, that we were railroaded by some steel tracks that didn't last and some settlers who wouldn't settle. And it's funny we're still here and calling ourselves half-breed. Just trying to find my watch under all of this paper. <laughs> Um, the other thing, I got a little bit obsessed with uh, researching bison for this, uh, this book because I just found them to be really amazing uh, creatures. Um, they, they have very few, uh, if any, uh, predators. And, um, you know, like they're 2,000 pounds, but they can turn on a dime because of their weight is over their head and their haunch, haunches. So if they are on those haunches, they just have to, like, pivot and you're a dead person <laughs> uh, because they're just uh, so amazing. Um, the other thing I wondered about when I was studying them was like, why did they have those beards? Like, what is that about? Like, you know? And what they would use that for is to brush away the snow so that they can get down to the, the grass underneath. Um, and the other thing is very, very territorial so that if there was anything on their migration routes, a little shack, a little, you know, a fence, they would, they would just trample it to the ground. Um, so I really became quite enamored with uh, bison, and uh, um, the, the Arapaho believe that where the bison came from deep, deep holes in the earth, and that when they disappeared from the earth, that's where they went back to. And the Blackfoot believe that they came from deep waters, and that when they disappeared, they went back to those deep waters. When they had the Buffalo Treaty signing in Banff, uh, the Blackfoot uh, went out to, uh, what is it, what lake is that? There's a lake just outside of Banff, and I've forgotten its name now, but, what's that? Minnewaka? Yeah, they went out to Minnewaka. That's where they had the, the ceremony uh, for the bison coming back, because it's a deep water. and. Uh, uh, this next, this poem is uh, a pontoon, which is a Malaysian form of um, just traditional uh, verse. And uh, Gabriel Dumont was known as a buffalo caller, which meant that he could uh, predict um, where they were going to be coming from. And he named his uh, gun La Petite. Notre frère. We were born beneath the water. In the darkest depths of the lake, we rise, our hooves rumbling, spewing lake water, muzzles dripping. In the darkest depths of the lake, will Gabriel call us his brothers, spewing lake water, muzzles dripping, pulling the universe in our sway. Will Gabriel call us his brothers, riding his swiftest buffalo runner, aiming la petite, pulling the universe in their sway, the Milky Way dust of buffalo spirits passing. Riding his swiftest buffalo runner, will Gabriel, aiming la petite, rise, his horse's hooves rumbling, dust of buffalo spirits passing. We were born beneath the water. Um, a favorite story of mine about uh, Gabriel Dumont being at Batoche um, when Louis was also there and the Canadian forces had occupied Batoche. Um, Gabriel Dumont there was, was there for four days and they were looking for, the Canadian forces were looking for him but they couldn't find him. And uh, what he would do, which I thought was just brilliant, just counterintuitive, he would follow the people that were after him. So. And, and I just thought about this. I thought, of course, of course that's it. Because if you follow them, they will never find you. 
right? They, they'll never know where you are because you know where they are at all times. So I just thought it was really brilliant of him to do that. And, um, and he would stay with uh, sympathizers in uh, Batoche uh, in the evening. And then, of course, he'd watch the scouts saddle up. And then he would ride in their tracks following them the whole day. Um, this is called No Single Blade of Grass. And um, <clears throat> Father Alexis Andre, oblate of Mary Immaculate, who accompanied Riel to the scaffold in 1885, um, responded when people were looking for Gabriel. He said, oh, you're looking for Gabriel? You're wasting your time. There's not a single blade of grass on the prairie that he does not know. Not a single bra blade of grass on the prairie you do not know. Not a single blade will betray and reveal your whereabouts. After the arrival of Middleton, the Northwest, Northwest Field Force, and the Gatling gun, after the death of your uncle, Aikipao, in battle, after the, after the troops set fire to your house and stable, after they confiscate your prized herd of horses and your billiard table, after Madeleine and Louis hide in the trees, after you are shot and wounded in the head, you will not surrender. Instead, you gather 80 rifle and 40 revolver cartridges and firearms from the Métis who surrendered or died, from the Canadian forces lying dead in the field, you will not be taken alive. And not a single blade of grass will renounce you, your life depending on the coolies, the leaves, limbs, blades of buffalo grass, so for four days at dawn, you follow Les Anglais patrols searching Batoche as morning light glints off their gun barrels and their horses' hooves breathe breath sort of signaling the direction of their advance. You trail them riding in their tracks to avoid being tracked, hiding in the bluffs, concealed in the coolies, crouched in the willows, the May nights cold along the river. Invisible but hunted, you slip through their sight to become the dogwood lining the South Saskatchewan, the ascending light at dawn and descending light at night, the poplars and cottonwoods flourishing along the river, the force of fierce winds pushing the soldiers back, the dust blown in their faces. When they moved, you moved. They stopped, you stopped. And each night, you'd return to Batoche for refuge until the next morning, you'd wait, watch them saddle up, and set out again in their tracks to stalk who stalks you. And not a single blade, not a single blade betrayed you. Um, I'm going to read you a poem called To a Fair Country. And yes, I did, I did, it is a, response to uh, John Ralston Saul to a fair country, where he argues that we're all Métis. And uh, I don't think so. <laughs> and the reason why is because this country would have treated us a lot better. To a fair country, I want to forget their names, the generals. I want to forget their names, the script commissioners and their escorts, land speculators, bankers, members of parliament, lawyers, shopkeepers and clergy, and how the bank and church held hands. I want to forget their hands fast as poker players dealing blue-green script coupons stiff as new money to northern Métis waiting for a homeland through survey and a land titles office existing only in the south. I want to forget the official trickery the northern Métis and their southern impersonators, redeeming land with their right hand and conferring it with their left into the smooth palm of speculators. I want to forget their ordinary faces, their benign smiles and dim hearts, mundane tre treachery and accumulating assets. I want to forget their orderly ledgers, lists, records, and deceptively even-handed calculations. I want to forget a traveling 36-man script commission with 26 speculators. I want to forget their numb greed and narrow vision. I want to forget their dollar and acre thefts. I want to forget the fraud and forgery, 
crooked schemers, connivers, and collaborators. I want to forget the 1921 amended Criminal Code of Canada and its three-year time limit on script fraud. And finally, I want to forget the number of Métis, less than 1%, who hold property from that script today. And uh, I think I'm just going to finish up here with, um, this is a poem to Louis Riel. Our Prince, if only your fine mind could have leapt in another time along this colony's narrow path to nationhood. It's not just that the path is narrow, but it's also borrowed from another people, another place. Be it trouble, tremble, or terror, you had to walk before the gallows, alone or with the priest that betrayed you at Batoche, anointing your last rites. God, curse them, Louis. They will regret this. Regret hanging you, it will be the shadow side of Canada's story, indelible as the iron stakes of ancestral memory on this grid map, witnessing clearly how the quarter sections got divvied up at mealtime, who received 200,000 acre grazing leases or railway mile belts, who accumulated in the greasy politics of real estate while there was still no land for the Métis. They will regret taking our prince, our prophet, and it will manifest in the markings of places previously touched by you, Louis, the one who gave us Manitoba, brokered pluralism and language rights. They will regret taking our prince, our prophet, the one among us gifted, our seer, because when they look across these plains, they will see the monuments built to him, the days named after him in recognition. And when their children ask what Louis did, they will have to answer. Thank you very much for listening. more people need to need to hear that. I, I, I think that's a story that needs to be told uh, definitely to more people and, and hopefully this is one of those ways we can make that happen. Uh, we're going to take some time for um, some questions uh, for Marilyn. So if anyone has any questions, um, yeah, please raise your hand or uh, you can ask your question and um, we can go from there. Do we have any questions? Marilyn, you said you arrived in Edmonton in 1984. Yeah. What sparked your search for finding out who you were? Um, well, because there's because there was I learned nothing about it in school, no. and it still teaches it still teaches nothing. The school does, I mean, because I, I teach first year English students. And uh, they, uh, just this past year, had to read The Inconvenient Indian by Thomas King. And they were all devastated. They were devastated by it. They didn't know that happened in Canada. And I kind of joke that, you know, that with this TRC, it's not, necess it's not the Indigenous people that need help. It's the non-Indigenous people who are traumatized by, by learning their real history in this country. And they feel ashamed, they feel guilty, they feel confused, because they have never learned it. What they have learned is that Europeans came here and civilized these backward subhumans, and, uh, and then everything was just fine. 
But when you dig into the history and they find out, uh uh, that ain't a, it ain't a pretty picture. And now we have to own that picture because we're part of Canada. Not to feel guilty, not to feel necessarily ashamed, but to do something about it now that they know. Um, so, as I say, the history books never taught us anything good, anything positive about Indigenous people. So as a young girl, I grew up thinking I was a big zero. And many children go to school like that, feeling like, one, if there is Indigenous knowledge, it's not important. And if there are Indigenous languages, they are not important. Which means, if you are an Indigenous child, you are not important. So um, I'm, I'm really grateful for series like this that uh, teaches, uh, you know, average Canadians their history. And I find the whole Edmonton area is just so rich with our Indigenous history, but much of it has been um, ignored, denied, suppressed. And so uh, it's a matter of doing this kind of, uh, you know, search, this, you know, for it and, and reading between the lines because even the history books that you will pick up and read about this place, there'll be things like this. For example, I was reading about Chief Factor Rowan going to Rocky Mountain House with um, David Thompson. And in the process of, you know, this big uh, adventure and all this stuff, they, he just, there was one sentence that said, along with 15 Aboriginal people. And what were those Aboriginal people doing? They were hunting and providing food. They were guiding. They were translating and interpreting. They were making medicines and making it available for these men to actually survive in this weather. And there were 15 of them, but they are not named. So those are the kinds of things um, we have to read between the lines and see ourselves there as Indigenous people, even though we're not named. None of the women, very rarely is an woman, Indigenous woman's name given. It's an Indian woman. That's what we know from history. Um, even though uh, many of these women were vital, and in fact, if you read any of the um, journals from you know, the explorers, the discoverers, they say, if, you're, if you don't have an Aboriginal woman on your trip, it's not going to be successful. Because they knew that that woman had the language, the traditional knowledge of hunting, uh, gathering medicines, uh, feeding, clothing these people. Because without her, they wouldn't have made it. They would have died. So, um, and that's what many, many of the early, you know, explorers and journal, journals say. David Thompson himself was married to Charlotte Small, who was Indian. You know, and they traveled back and forth uh, across this country by canoe. I think it was two or three times. And with children, can you imagine being in a canoe for like that time with toddlers, with an infant? That's what they did. So, um, yeah, so I'm really, it's, it's really sad actually that uh, Canadians don't recognize that because, um, yeah, the thing is, uh, the settlers wouldn't have survived had it not been for the help of Indigenous people. You know, people talk about, oh, sod busting and, you know, strong settlers and that. Yeah, they were, they were. But the very first ones here, I'm sorry, they would not have survived without Indigenous people to help them. Yeah. Um, I guess building on to that question, some of my um, hesitations come when, and when you were searching for that information and just like you talked about, you come across information that is questionable or missing. How, where did you go and how did you decipher about Exactly, and I don't, I don't think there is one story. There's many, many stories. Um, um, and I, I wasn't so much looking for the correct story. Um, 
as the truth. <laughs> the truth in the, in the sense of this is what Indigenous people did. And so I've imagined that in you know, some of these poems. But I guess I've imagined, I've in, I've in, I've in, sorry, I've imagined them at the center of the history as opposed to being on the periphery of history. Yeah. Could you uh, relate uh, the story of uh, how the Mehi settlements uh, were established uh, in the province? Uh, there's a beautiful story of the five Métis uh, people that uh, yeah. went and gathered the information in, in Alberta. Uh, there was a commission that was established by the provincial government. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, the Ewing Commission. Um, and I, I can't, now the, the Métis Betterment Act was signed in 1938. So it would have been previous to that where people like Jody On, Gerald Tom, um, I'm forgetting their names. Malcolm Norris. Yeah, Malcolm Norris, James Brady. Yeah. Um, there was another, one other name too, I can't remember now. But, but essentially what was happening is that Métis people were living on Crown land. And, uh, and <coughs> leaders from the Métis community realized that that was a very uh, precarious place for Métis to be because the Crown can just come and take it at any time. So uh, they lobbied uh, the provincial government uh, for lands set aside for Métis. And um, we actually have eight Métis settlements in Alberta today because of that. There was at one point 12, I believe, but uh, some of them were decommissioned and I, I have no, I have no uh, idea why they were. Um, but when I mentioned script fraud, that was a, a leverage. That was a leverage for these five uh, men to lobby the government, because they knew what went on in this province. They knew when their script commission came into town with 36 members, and more than half of them were speculators, that they knew they had a leverage. And that's how we got Métis settlements in, in Alberta. There's no other province in Canada that has them. Um, well, essentially what would happen is that, as I say, because a lot of the times, you know, with government, you have to go to the office, right? The government office. Well, what if you live up in La Ronge, Saskatchewan, and the office is down in Regina? How are you going to get there if you have no money, no way of really getting there? There were people that were impersonators that came and collected script um, in other people's name, there were speculators that stood around and bought land for really cheap because people were starving. Um, if you look at, there's a book called Clearing the Plains by James Dashuk, where he looked at the uh, epidemiological records um, of kind of hospitals and that kind of thing. And it discovered that it was a deliberate government policy to starve indigenous people off their lands so that they would be complicit to things like signing of treaties and that kind of thing. And uh, so there was a lot of script fraud. Um, for example, I write about a woman called Elizabeth Brass Donald, whose husband worked for the Hudson's Bay here for over 30 years as a carpenter and blacksmith. Her husband was awarded a piece of land which is where the Mutart Conservatory sits today. And for some unknown reason, that land ended up in Rutherford's name. Um, and the family still has the, la the title. So, you know, there was, there was stuff going on that was not... Uh, people cashed in. People cashed in on people's uh, misfortune. Um, starvation, as I said, uh, dislocation and fracturing of family units. Um, <coughs> loss of that uh, leadership. Uh, so, you know, the, the, a lot of the, uh, the indigenous community were, they were in, they were in strife. There was un, they were under a lot, tremendous amount of stress. And one of them was lack of food. 
Um, and this was during the time when the buffalo had, the uh, herds had, you know, lessened. And uh, yeah, so um, it, it, was, it was a difficult time and, and, uh, and people took advantage of that. And then also what happened is that when the Papas Chase people came, uh, were here and lobbying for their treaty, um, the good old script commission came in and tried to get them to sign, get to um, take script. And some of them took script and immediately turned around and somebody bought the script from them. So that leaves you with no status whatsoever, no connection to land. So um, those kinds of things happened a lot. And as I say, um, you know, what is it, less than 1% of that scripted land is in Métis hands today. And compare that to Cochrane, Cochrane Ranch, uh, who is a senator, got 200,000 acres of grazing lease. The railway, the CPR, got a mile belt, a mile of land on either side of the, ra of the railway all the way across the continent. They sold off that land for very, for lots of money. And as you know, you had those CPR, you know, hotels, that's built on their land. And they sold off uh, other parts of the land um, and made a lot of money. Is it time for Bannock? <laughs> oh. I think it's really cool that you uh, identify as an indigenous feminist. Was there a pivotal point in your life that you started applying that term to yourself? I think just recently. You know, I'm 62 now, and the thing is I've watched what has happened in terms of my career and the work that I do. I worked my ass off. I worked my butt off to get where I am. And I've watched male writers who have done less, get promoted over Indigenous women writers all across this country. Indigenous male writers are applauded. They're, you know, kind of held up as the real writer because a male is a real writer, not a female. A female is just dabbling, right? But the unfortunate thing is that as a single woman writer, I have had to make a living all these years with 50% less wage than male writers. The Writers Union of Canada did uh, a survey in 2015 that found out just that. Male writers make 50% more than female writers. So, um, so that's one of the reasons, and I, I see it all over the place, where men are privileged, and I'm not, I'm not a man-hater, but I see that, that men are very privileged, and men often don't recognize it. Um, even though there were women who are doing the same work, struggling, getting paid less. Um, so that's why I'm a feminist, because how can we live as, as independent women if we aren't paid the same? if we're expected to live on half, but produce the same work and sometimes better work. So that's one of the reasons why I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs>